And the staff who ran it were all Czechs who'd been in England during the war in the RAF. I mean, one of them said to me, they, they keep us here so they can keep an eye on us. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss a single episode. MZ was an East German motorcycle manufacturer located in Joppau, Saxony. The acronym MZ stood for Motorenwerke Joppau, or German for Joppau Engine Factory. In the 1980s, MZ was regarded by the British motorcycle press as producing ugly and old-fashioned, if worthy, motorcycles. However, there was a hardcore set of UK fans who loved this relatively cheap and easy-to-repair bike. Julian Howe was a big fan of the MZ bike. He tells of a bizarre honeymoon of fellow MZ club members which involved 15 MZ bikes from the UK touring Western Europe and the Warsaw Pact countries. From sharing drinks with a border guard to being on the receiving end of CS gas in Krakow, it's a tour through late 1980s Europe on the back of a two-stroke. Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will keep this project going and allow me to continue preserving these incredible stories. You'll join our community, get the sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, I'm Abe Brandt and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially, quite simply because it's the best history podcast out there and I want to make sure it continues. Keep going Ian and thank you. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram via the links in the episode notes and stay bang up to date with the latest from Cold War Conversations. I'm delighted to welcome Julian Howe to our Cold War conversation. They're cheap and um, cheerful and polluting two strokes that were made in East Germany. A dealer in Sheffield started importing them and um, I, I bought one, I had several. And they're sort of like a cult bike. They're small, uh, cheap, uh, they're still a thriving club now. And people travel all over on them just, you know, as a sort of bit of English uh, eccentricity. <laughs> and were they quite easy to fix, a bit like a Trabant? Were they, you know, easy to repair? Absolutely, although I've got very little um, mechanical expertise. But with being a two-stroke, there's very little on them. And with them being made in East Germany, uh, you know, it was so that the people there could, could maintain them easily. I mean, I also remember with a handbook, because they were translated, uh, I haven't got a handbook now, but they were translated badly into um, English. So, for example, there was one quote in there. It said, wash your motorbike with the same kind of soap that your wife uses on her stockings, which uh, all struck me as a bit of an odd, um, <laughs> odd thing. Yeah, lost a bit in translation, obviously. Obviously, yeah, yeah. We, you, you were a member of a club then, of sort of fellow enthusiasts? The MZ Riders Club, which is still going now. Uh, as I say, people went to the Nord Cap on them, the south of Europe. It's just one of those things about getting something that's totally unsuitable. And then, I mean, one year we had the AG, I suggested we had an AGM in uh, Applecross, northwest Scotland, which is about 500 and odd miles from the house and a lot of people turned up for it just because it was perverse that it was a long way away it was a challenge I guess. absolutely and then as i said i'd left the ta i saw an advert in the magazine for the this thing called the gypsy rally in 1989 and i realized that there was a chance to get to the other side of the fence because i'd looked at it from this side with the army and it was difficult to get in there and this was somehow sort of 
sanctioned it was possible to do. One of the, one of the members got married in Oxford. So this was their honeymoon. <laughs> With a load of other bikers. <laughs> yeah, a lot of whom they'd never met. <laughs> Um, and and then we sort of they had a sidecar though, um, so this was their honeymoon. But there was also this gypsy rally being held in Europe, so we sort of tied it all in. They got married in Oxford. Then we went across the Channel, through Belgium, Netherlands, to West Germany. Then jumped the border into East Germany. And who who planned this route? Who who had organised this? The club gave us a sort of skeleton, and then we all had to, because of course it was pre-internet, so we all had to um, organise our own visa insurance. I know when I insured it, I, I said to the insurance agent, I'm insuring my motorbike, not East Europe third party, because the insurance was quite exorbitant. Pre-internet, it was laborious with East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. But we managed to do it. They gave us um, a schedule and a rough cost, and we booked the visas and everything ourselves. We did cut out Warsaw. It was just too much for us, so we did adapt the route. How did you get an East German visa in the 1980s? Did you have to go to the East German embassy? I didn't physically go to any of the embassies. I just did it all by correspondence. I, I never got any impression during the entire tour anyone was at all interested in us or following us. I never met anyone who seemed suspicious. But unlike a lot of people, we just toured up to the border. I think it was Eisenach we crossed that, and then went on our, our merry way. And what was that border crossing like? I mean... Presumably you didn't just flash your passport and go straight through. No, they, uh, luckily I'd got a West German with me who interpreted and changed some of the, uh, you know, I tried to catch a few jokes, maybe that wasn't appropriate, so he, he filtered those out, possibly fortunately. But, I mean, the one thing, the things that struck me were that I didn't find the border guards at all intimidating because although they're armed to the teeth, it looked like they cut 21 uniforms out of the cloth for 20. So all the sleeves were short and the trousers were above the ankles. And I, I just, somehow it, did, it didn't, you know, it, 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 they just looked silly. I mean, the, you could see that there was people working on the border with their armed guards, following them around. You could see where there was um, barriers that they could push a button and barriers would shoot across the road and block everyone. I suppose because we're on motorbikes, they obviously didn't think we'd got anything of interest with us. And what I find funny about some of the previous podcasts is I thought no one would occur, to, you know, it wouldn't occur to anyone to keep my money in my shoe. And it turns out almost everyone that's had a podcast kept their money in the shoe. So maybe I should have thought of somewhere um, different. But as I say, once we were through, we were left to our own devices and as others had said on the podcast the first thing you notice was we appeared to go from color to black and white and the grime and completely you know cross that line a completely different world in that when you say black and white what, what do you mean by that because you st obviously still got the colors of the countryside are you saying that the buildings and the clothing was dull or, or what are you saying there yes yes dull Places weren't painted. Yeah, just a general sort of air of neglect. Not everything was in black and white. I mean, I've seen colour no. photos of East oh, Germany, yeah. and there's people wearing red, yellow, you know, th yeah. there's broad yeah. colours there. Absolutely. But, I mean, remember, there's no advertising holdings at all. Mm. You know, and they they make a difference, don't they? Things like that, yeah. you know. So it was a sort of stripped-down world. Where did you first stop in East Germany then? What was your first stop on that route? We parted along. We, we crossed by a Russian army camp, which closely resembled a scrapyard. And I was quite staggered at the state of it and the state of the soldiers at the front. And funnily enough, 
when I'd been at Ashford, the School of Military Intelligence, one of the instructors there said, it hit him. He'd done all the training. They gave him the chance to go over the border and he couldn't believe, you know, how scruffy everything was. Uh, you know, the army stuff, unlike the British Army, you know, it was a, a mess. I mean, we went along the motorways. The smog was horrendous because, uh, of course, all the vehicles virtually were two stroke, the Truants, the MZs. When you came to a power station, they were burning lignite, which is like one step up from peat. And you could see this yellowy brown smoke drifting across the motorway and you could feel it in the back of your throat. The first night, we, first couple of nights, we camped at Leipzig, which was near the MZ factory. Although I still can't work out, we never, I never actually went to the MZ factory. And I also remember at night, there was nightingales in the park. There was this heavy smog. And then as the sun set, it turned a darker and darker chocolate color because it was cutting through more and more pollution as the angle of the sun dropped. Were you camping? All, all the while, yes, we were camping. We stayed two nights in Leipzig and then we stayed there on the way back as well. Right. And what was your interaction with uh, East German citizens at these stops? We we sort of, you know, especially the West Germans, knew East Germans who got MZ. So we sat around the table drinking. And discussing what sort of soap that you use to uh, clean your MZ. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A stockings. Wash my stockings in. Um, I mean, I also remember there was one guy who was a border guard who said to me, you know, if anyone crossed, I wouldn't shoot them, you know. I said, you know, I don't really think you should be talking like that. I think with being in the army, I felt differently. I knew, you know, I knew I was in a police state. Uh, we did have some people who thought it was Uncle Eric Honecker and everything was wonderful. And they seemed a bit more casual about it. But from my own point of view, I, um, yes, I, I, I was careful. I would say I did, I did mention that I, I, I smelt something over the pollution, which was cannabis, and said to someone, are you smoking a joint? He said, yeah, you know, the East Germans can't get it. And I'm thinking, we could be inside for 10 years for this. You know, I mean, I mean, the people, people bought CDs and stuff in for them, which is a bit more harmless. Um, just want to go back. So one of the guys, one of the East Germans you were speaking to said he was an East German border guard. Yeah, yeah. And did he share any other information with you? No, I mean, I, I was a bit worried about him talking. <laughs> you know, I was a bit worried about him talking. I thought he was sort of a, exposing himself a bit. So, uh, no, no. But as I say, it was funny. It never got any impression anyone was planted with us to watch us. And there we were, just, you know, roaming around. I mean, we got French and German guys with us and things. So... Yeah, so if if one who could speak English, you know, so it was a bit difficult to talk to, you know, any members of the public in any of the countries, really, unless they could speak English. We were a bit restricted. I mean, one thing, one one thing I remember the motorways was the autobahns was that as you went along, what you were looking for was black patches on the road because that was where there was a bump and the oil was dropping off the sump of the vehicles. So this black streak of oil gave you a warning when there was a, when there was a pothole come in. Was that a tip you picked up from one of the East Germans or did somebody, No, you just uh... saw it. No, you just noticed it. Yes, yeah. But I say, I really do think the one thing was, you know, the, the smog coming off these power stations, this yellowy brown stuff and just seeing it, you know, it's like steam off our power stations, but it just drift. So it just drifted across the motorways and everywhere. And then the huge sites where the lignite has been stripped as well. You know, it. it uh, I don't think they cared much about the environment. After that, we headed off to. I think it was Golitz. We went through to Poland, and I always. But yeah, coming through that border was, there seemed to be a huge trade in worn out second hand tyres that were strapped on all the cars. I couldn't quite work um, that one out. And at this time, the, the Warsaw Pact was creaking. So there were fuel 
problems as well. Um, so what they were doing was they, they were bringing petrol, I believe, from West Germany through East Germany to Poland as well. So fuel could be a problem because the MZs drink it. You, are, you don't get more than about 130 miles out of tank. Because Poland at this time, was, Solidarity had been um, legalised again for a number of years and they were coming yep. up to their first election where the people could vote for yep. Solidarity. So what, was the, what do you remember of the atmosphere in Poland versus the atmosphere that you saw in East Germany? Again, you see, because you can't really talk to people, you can only observe. I mean, there were solidarity signs all over the place. And in Krakow, that was the only time I've been actively gassed. We went into the market square for coffee and the students decided they'd have a riot and the riot police decided they'd lob CS gas. So we were sitting there having coffee and suddenly um, there's the whiff of CS gas starts coming across. Because you can't talk to people but you did get that sense with the solidarity signs all over the place that things were changing as i say with the fuel it could be touch and go to get it and one incident i also remember is i was in the middle of nowhere and i thought i, I never know how we all got there and back because i can't remember we couldn't sort of phone each other up if we broke down or anything like this you know but we, we managed to wing it because there must have been 20 odd of us on it and I was running low on fuel. I thought, I won't take a risk. I'll go in this village. And a huge queue for the petrol station. So I think, well, I've got no choice. Just pull up, put the bike on the stand and wait. And, of course, having a GB plate in a fairly small town, people started trying to talk to me. I got my map out, showed them I come from Leicester, and they were all pointing at Sheffield. So I was working on the assumption um, they knew people there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been tipped off that um, car stickers were the thing, the currency to have, you see. Like Castrol signs and Shell and stuff that you put in your Michelin that you put in your, you know, in your car window at that time. And I also remember I pulled some of these. Uh, uh, so I pulled these out to give them to the kids and the adults mugged them and took them off them so they could stick them in their cars, which I thought was quite... But what was even weirder was this tanker turned up and filled up. Then suddenly I realised there was a lot more cars in the queue behind me because people would just parked the cars up and then moved them and went off from work and whatever and pushed them down. So I tried to move out the queue to let them go by. And they were great. They were so embarrassed that they took me to the front of the queue and in front of these like huge number of cars, they filled me up first, which I thought was very kind of them. And I'm going, you're sure there's going to be no problem, this sort of thing. You know, I was quite worried. And um, I mean, when we got to Krakow, the students had cars and they manned them through the queue, filled up, took them outside onto the road pumped the fuel out and sold it by the can to people who were wealthy and didn't want to wait. But we did have the advantage in a lot of Poland that MZs will run on anything and they took the fuel that weren't put in most of the cars, so you generally got it a bit quicker. But it was, I, I, I sent you a photograph, it's a very poor one, where you can see a huge queue of cars at the petrol station. Oh, yeah. So things, things, were, things were creaking. Yeah. And a solidarity sign as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And in Poland, as I said, we, I remember the food there. We, we had something we called Edamski, which was like a rubberized version of Edam cheese. And then um, we had Cuban pineapple, which was quite rough. Uh, but there wasn't much variety in the, um, in the shops. The black market for Zlotis was amazing, but once you got Zlotis, there was nothing to spend it on yeah did you eat out at all no no we ate out because it was quite reasonable and we in krakow we went to this holiday inn that was like casablanca i mean there were some real winking black marketeers and people in there but they didn't care that we were motorcyclists as long as you got our currency or whatever you know you were you you were you quids in and what we realized was that the car park attendant was the key guy 
because he minded cars and he was the one that would do the champagne and the caviar and all the deals. I think, I think to be a car park attendant, you have to pay for your position because it was so <laughs> lucrative. I was in the deal with the car park. And yeah. Wow. So going through rural Poland, what what did you see there? I mean, the, you know, I've I've heard people describe the agriculture at that time, you know, almost looking like it was back in the 19th century. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because we went to Zakopan, which is in the Tatra Mountains, which was the equivalent of Switzerland for East Europe. So there was wealthy Russians, never on go there, because obviously they couldn't get out to Switzerland or anywhere. So, um or the mountains and the meadows and everything. Um, and, and, you know, when you went along a road, any roads that went off, were a lot of, well, most of them were dirt tracks. Uh, you know, it was like going back to the 1920s or possibly pre-World War One compared to England. And as I say, there was one point where I remember, say, going along a big plane and seeing a complete row of workers with hose weed in i don't know possibly a beetroot field or something but you know quite amazing that they were still using mass manual labor just for weeding in the fields yeah i went to krakow and zakopane in 1980 and i remember seeing people scything the fields and big hay wains drawn by horses and it was yeah it, it, it did feel like um going back in time so, yeah, interested to see even almost 10 years yeah, later, absolutely. it was still pretty similar. The first campsite we stopped at in Poland, he told us he was closed. He didn't open until the next week. Then he said, but I can let you stay, but I can't charge you. And that's when I realized communism was doomed because um, <laughs> we assumed he wasn't going to let us stay at all. He let us stay, but because he wasn't open, he couldn't charge us. I don't know why he didn't just take the cash in hand, but that was his, uh, yeah. That was interesting. And then after Poland, we crossed through Czechoslovakia without stopping, through quite rural areas, and then dropped into Hungary, where the border guards were very smart. Uh, they, they, yes, they, they won the best border guard awards of the, the trip. So we actually clipped through this quite remote, what would it be, northeast area Czech, of which would be Slovakia. Slovakia now. So we crossed through there and then uh, went into Hungary. And as I say, the one, th one of the things I remember about Hungary, because it was like June, you get all that willow fluff. And we were white with it, you know, because um, there were so many willow trees. And we ended up, we had a rally where we camped up in a national park east of Budapest. I think that was the one where we found out it was actually cheaper to stay in a hut than it was to put the tent out, which seemed quite uh, quite reasonable. While we were there, we had a trip to a museum, and you know, Hungary was a lot more uh, consumer orientated and uh, freelance and less order. You know, and um, this guy had he got an amazing house, two stories, and it was absolutely the back of it was full of motorbikes, but they were ones that had been imported before World War II, a lot of them, American ones and British ones and everything. Uh, and we, we looked around this museum, we thought, well, you know, the value, of, because they were scrap metal. He was just literally getting them out of barn and giving mm. the farmer a packet of fags and getting them. And he got this huge collection of these old American, British, German motorbikes that would be worth a small fortune, but built his own, uh, his own museum. Because Hungary at that period, they'd sort of liberalised almost on the quiet in terms of their economy. So it was, you know, probably during that period, it was a little bit more Western style yeah. almost from a consumerism point of Absolutely. view. Absolutely. I mean, we passed through Budapest. We didn't stop there. I mean, my recollection of the place, it was a lovely place. It was cheap and the food was really, really good. And then we went back into Czechoslovakia. My recollection of that was lots of banners and loudspeakers trying to stir the masses up. And lots of, as you said earlier, horses and horses and carts. You know, you, you say banners there. So when you were going through villages, there was political posters and 
because uh, in some in some towns in Eastern Europe, well, a lot of towns in Eastern Europe, they would have loudspeakers from the lamp posts. Yeah. To sort of broadcast to the population at certain points. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, you know we heard those, and then I've been pre-warned about the police. Because they had VB on the side of the cars, and at that time I was a big follower of Wayne Gardner, who was a intrepid motorcycle racer and total lunatic. And he'd been in trouble with them when he'd done a Grand Prix over there, and he, he claimed the VBs to be vicious bastards. And we got flagged down by some, so we were quite um, quite concerned about this. Anyway, we had a chat with them, and they were fine. And you know, Marlboro cigarettes were a good currency. The local cigarettes, if you bought a packet, by the time you'd done 50 miles, you'd got white tubes with tobacco at the bottom of the packet. They weren't all that good quality. <laughs> anyway, we had a chat with them, and then they said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll take you to the campsite. So they just put the blues and twos on and said, follow us. And we went through this town, and we were going over the zebra crossings, red lights, the lot. I think they were trying to shake us off. But it's a really surreal experience, um, charging through this town, chasing the police who were... I think they're just showing off. But uh, so, what what cities did you go into in Czechoslovakia? Did you go into Prague? Went Bratislava. I remember I met a guy there who could speak English, who was into drumming, and um, into music. And and when I got back, I, I posted him a music magazine. I didn't hear from him, so I don't know whether he got put away for that or something. I don't know. But anyway, I got his address. Went to all this trouble and posted it. He, he's a nice guy. And then we went to Prague and we camped right in the centre of Prague at a campsite. Uh, and the staff who ran it were all Czechs who'd been in England during the war in the RAF. And uh, I mean, one of them said to me, they, they keep us here so they can keep an eye on us. And because they could speak English, you know, they were OK with the tourists. Yeah, that was quite sort of a, a little sort of strange thing that you just bump into people in Prague who, who were with the RF during the war. They went to, I think they went to the embassy once a year, although it might have been frowned on, but they went there for a reception once a year. Yeah, well, there was a significant contingent of uh, Czech pilots in, in the RAF during the uh, the Battle of Britain and obviously the remainder of the of the war as well. They made a significant contribution alongside the Poles. Absolutely. Yeah, and some stayed, and some went back, and some went back, and then came back again, fortunately for them, maybe. I remember, as I say, that there was helicopters flying over. You got the feeling that they were keeping their eye on things. You got the feeling things were, uh, you know, brewing. And, of course, you know, the point is, when I got back the next year, so I was like, oh, look, I was there, and I was there as things kicked off. But you did you did get the impression there. I say, you see, unfortunately, we'd not been able to speak the language. There wasn't many people you could. But you did get the feeling. I mean, whenever you went into Prague, there was people wanted you to open a bank account with them because they wanted foreign currency accounts. They, they needed a sort of Brit or someone to do it. We are always getting um, asked for that. And... I mean, while I was there, I went to the site of where um, Jan Palak did himself pay uh, tribute to him. So Jan Palak was the student who set himself on fire in 1969, I think it was, as a protest against the uh, the Soviet invasion. So presumably the location, did the location have flowers there or anything like that? It wasn't or? very well marked. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't imagine. I know it, it was at the, it was at the top. It was at the, I remember it was at the top. Yeah, it's at the top of Wenceslas Square. Just yes, that's below right. on the, the, on the uh, slope National there. Museum. It's, yeah. It's very wide leads up to it. Yeah. I so I do remember one incident there where I, with a car it's easier to remember which side of the road you're on if you're driving on yeah. The opposite side with the motorbike it's different than things. So you got confused sometimes. I remember once in there turning left and facing four solid steams of traffic because I was trying to go down a wrong one way. Because um, after that, then we headed back through East Germany, stayed again in Leipzig, and then headed home. It was two weeks on the road. And uh, I mean, the one non political, what was funny was, as I say, MZ riders are perverse. You, know, you want to do something on a piece of equipment that's totally unsuitable just for the challenge. 
and we were at Zeebrugge and there was two of us and these guys on these BMWs and most probably their leathers were worth more than my bike you know and they were sort of sneering at us with the because I've given you some photographs where you can see we wrap things in bin liners and stuff and uh, we're not exactly uh, smart and uh, they were saying oh you know we've been where did you come from and we said well Venlo, which was where we'd stayed that night, and they said, oh, "Yes, we toured round there, you know, for, you know." And they'd been there about a week, and they said, "We, we actually went to Germany." And so, so did we both. I said, "What's it called? East and West?" What? Of course, Poland. And my mate said, "Yeah, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Czech, East Germany." And the <laughs> looks on their faces—it was worth going through all the, um, yes, all of it for that, and then. Uh, of course, I got home, and as uh, Charlie Wood said in an earlier podcast, um, you end up with huge wads of money, but nothing much you can do with them. And I remember giving them cruelly to my younger daughter, who thought she was a, a millionaire with all these banknotes, not realizing, I've actually got a photograph, of it, not realizing they were completely um, valueless. But as I say, it was, it was, it was a peculiar experience, and you know, to look the next year at things and see it, the same places you've been through. Yeah, because I went back to Prague years later, and of course it was just a normal European McDonald sort of consumer city, entirely different than the one, you know, I'd been to, because uh, mm. of course all European cities now look much the, the same. Uh, I, th I think Prague is is pretty unique in its uh, pres preservation, but yeah, no, I understand what you're saying about the uh, commercialization. A lot of people who've never travelled to Eastern Europe during the Cold War are sort of like amazed at you travelling there. That's what I found when yeah. when I'd come back is that well, why on earth would you want to go there? Mm. I've always had an interest in East Europe. From when I first got married and met the Latvians and the Ukrainians and the Poles that lived near me and went to their clubs and spoke to them. I mean, they'd, um, I mean, you sit in a pub with a table full of guys and half had fought on one side in World War Two and half had fought on the other side. I was always interested. But, I mean, it was interesting to go, but I didn't feel any sense of sort of fear because you've really... Lots of people went in and out of the no, and uh, you've got to do something silly or be, you know, extremely unfortunate for it to happen. I mean, they might have been sort of police states, but I mean, let's face it, how many tourists ever really ended up in trouble? And I'm sure if they did, the embassy would get them, get them out anyway. I mean, the, the other thing that I've heard from people is People have felt very safe, even wandering around those cities late at night. They felt safe in Eastern Europe because of potentially the pervasive nature of the uh, security. Um, the biggest danger was falling over drunks, you know. I mean, especially Poland. I mean, you know, you'd be, you just saw people drunk all over the place, but. Yeah, I mean, because we're in a group, we tended to sort of, if we went out, there'd always be a few of us. The next year, it was all change. Yeah, all gone. Yeah. Or almost gone. Absolutely. Um, what, what would you say was your most memorable experience when you were on that trip? I mean, strangely, I suppose the beetroot field with the people hurried. I don't know, it just struck me as just being so... I know that might sound funny, but uh, it just struck me as uh, 20 or 30 people in a row with hose. You know, I mean, if I went across the fence to Ely, which is very similar sort of territory, you know, and that did sort of strike me that, you know, they were a long, long way behind. I appreciate you um, sharing that, Thank Julian. You. Really interesting to uh, hear, hear about your, your travels there and i think you you are keen to resuscitate an old feature of cold war conversations um which uh, more recent listeners might not realize but in the early episodes i was asking guests um their favorite films and books and various other 
uh, thing. So, Julian, what have you what have you got there for us? Some of favourite film. I've got the death of Stalin. How anyone ever persuaded backers? You know, you go in to see film backers and say, I want to do a semi comedy on the death of Stalin. And people put money up was beyond me. But to me, it was on two levels. It was it was humorous. But it also demonstrated what it was like that people are perpetually worried what line to follow in case they're thought to be it's deviating that there was that permanent menace about it that if you're in that system you just never knew did you one morning the door not and you're gone for no reason um as I say, random death in there. There's the KGB guy who clears the house up and then just gets shot in the back of the head as he thinks he's done a good job. When you become a dictator, you don't get to retire. There is no retirement plan for a dictator. With the book, as I say, I've picked General Sir John Hackett, the untold story about World War Three, which was published in 1978 and updated in 82 which is a long, long time ago, where he envisaged what would happen if there was a war between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And the reason I th that book's come to mind recently is that in that, we're just about going into nuclear Armageddon and hack it, imagines a Ukrainian officer stops it. And then, and then and finally, you see, I thought I'd do music because, um, I mean, I love Georgian Balkan music, but uh, my favourite band, uh, I'm going to plug them, is Gogo Bordello, who are known as the um, the best Ukrainian gypsy punk band in the world. And I've been to see them live many times, even when uh, he sings with his head in a fire bucket. And uh, I can highly, um, <laughs> I can I can highly recommend to go to one of their concerts. Thank you. I will be rushing to YouTube to see uh, this guy sing with his head in a fire bucket. Well, his yeah. other, he his sold other, it to me. His other trick is he's, they've got the really big bass drums, that, and he, he throws that on the crowd and then stands on it singing while the crowd pass him round. Brilliant. <laughs> I'll be uh, making sure there are links to uh, Gogo -Go Bordello. In there we are. <laughs> so. Uh, just in case listeners have a problem I'm finding that. that. I'm, I'm intrigued now. I'm intrigued. Uh, there was or there was the three people, wasn't there? There was that one. We'll do that. Oh, one. yeah. There yeah, was three the three people, people mm. alive or dead, who uh, yeah. you would love to uh, and, have to and, dinner. And I'd got Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I read him when I was in my teens. Uh, Sir John Hackett, because I'd be interested to see what he thinks about the current situation, being so he knew there was a difference with Russian. And Senator John McCain, because of his experiences in Vietnam as a prisoner of war. And that's it. Over and out to you here. Yeah, that is okay. a good choice. A good yep. choice. I'm tempted <laughs> to bring this back as a regular slot. I'll... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I might put a poll out on Twitter or somewhere and just see what the appetite is because I, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that that was mm. uh, some some good uh, choices there there are photos and videos illustrating this episode in our episode notes look for the link in the podcast information now, this podcast would not exist without our financial supporters, and I want to thank one and all of them for their generous support. If you want to help us, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.